Good morning, everyone. I'm Sarah Purcell, Director of the Rosenfield Program in Public Affairs, International Relations, and Human Rights, and in the History Department at Grinnell. And it's a pleasure to see so many bright and happy faces here this morning for our Scholars Convocation, which is the keynote address for our Grinnell Young Innovators for Social Justice Prize Symposium Week. We've had a fantastic week already with a chance to meet our wonderful winners of the, the first ever Grinnell Prize. And you can read more about them in the, in the program here. And I hope that you will consider coming back. There's still a little time left to meet the winners and to hear them. In addition to which, they will probably be back on campus in the future, giving short courses and interacting with our students. We intend for this to be a, a fruitful relationship with them. Um, you can meet informally with some of the winners this afternoon at 2.30. They will be in the Spencer Grill in the JRC. Um, and then at 4.15 this afternoon, Rabbi Melissa Weintraub will give the final talk in the series um, here in Herrick Chapel. And then this, tonight at 5.30, immediately following her talk, there will be a campus reception for the prize symposium in the Bucksbaum Rotunda. So please join us for any and all of those activities. When the Grinnell Prize was conceived, the idea was to reward and inspire people under the age of 40 who are making great strides for positive social change and social justice in the world, and to really capture those folks who have already made some demonstration of their impact and their innovation on providing justice in the world and solving social problems, but also then to give them a push into the future while they still are relatively young um, to achieve even more for justice. And when we were thinking about the symposium, when we would invite the winners to campus, we wanted to um, complement their youth um, and the youth of our students with an opportunity to also hear from um, a real master of the social justice activism and the fight. And that's what we will hear this morning for the keynote. The idea being that there's a resonance between people with longer experience in social justice work and our winners and then our students. And that this is a real generational conversation we hope to inspire on our campus. We are incredibly thrilled and honored to welcome this morning Morris Dees, who is co-founder of the Southern Poverty Law Center, and I know he's well known to many of you in this room. He co-founded the SPLC in 1971 following a successful business and law career. He started a direct mail sales company specializing in book publications while still a student at the University of Alabama, where he also obtained his law degree. He also launched a successful law practice in Montgomery, Alabama in 1960, and as a lawyer, he won a series of groundbreaking civil rights cases that helped to integrate government and public institutions. He also served as finance director for former President Jimmy Carter's campaign in 1976 and for Democratic presidential nominee George McGovern in 1972. Both Morris Dees and the Southern Poverty Law Center are known for innovative lawsuits that have crippled some of America's most notorious white supremacist hate groups. Um, he personally has received more than 20 honorary degrees and awards too numerous to mention here. But they include the Trial Lawyer of the Year from the Trial Lawyers for Public Justice and the Martin Luther King Jr. Memorial Award from the National Education Association. Dees has published three books and he was named one of the 100 most influential lawyers in America by the National Law Journal in 2006. The Southern Poverty Law Center continues its fight for civil rights and justice um, in the United States, um, not only working on issues of racial equality and rights, but also spreading into many other areas of civil rights litigation and advocacy, including immigrant rights, GLBTQ issues, children's rights, and really any challenge to civil rights and equality. Um, so I think it'll be a wonderful session um, as we think about the Grinnell Prize going into the future, and I'm really honored to welcome Morris Dees to Grinnell. Well, thank you for your, your warm welcome. The things that uh, she said about me and my career were 
things that I didn't do just by myself. In fact, the head of our Immigrant Justice Project is Dan Werner, a graduate of Grinnell. And uh, he told me to be sure to send his regards to each of you. I was thinking as I was driving here this morning from uh, Des Moines, how did I get from the cotton fields of Alabama to the corn fields of Iowa? <laughs> and, I, and I just thought about it a while, and I, I was just thinking this morning when I was thinking what I might, might say to you, and a lot of you are not from Iowa. In fact, most of you are not. So we all share a lot of things in common. But I think, I think it probably started back in the cotton fields of a small community I grew up in in Montgomery County, Alabama. My people didn't have any land. They were just renters, sharecroppers, you might call them. And there were really two classes of folks down there. There were the blacks that worked the fields and the white folks that owned them. I was really glad that my parents didn't own any land, and I am mean, now. Then I didn't. I was ashamed of it then. But now I'm glad because I had a chance to meet a whole different group of people because I was out in the cotton field picking cotton with them. And, but if, I think it was more than just that. I think it was a little community I grew up with in that, in that uh, area. And I, I kind of put the blame maybe for what I do on my uh, teacher in that little small school. We had only 75 students in the school. And Mrs. Verabelle Johnson was my teacher in the fourth and fifth and sixth grade. They were all in, in one room. And she uh, was also my Sunday school teacher in a Baptist church that didn't look much different than this. And you could really never tell when you were in school and in church back in the 50s when I was going to school because <laughs> we had a Bible verse in both places every day. And Mrs. Johnson wanted us to grow up to be successful people, good boys and girls and men and women. And she, there are two things that this dear lady who taught my dad, she taught two of my boys, taught me too before I think they closed that little school to get rid of her. But there were two things that, there were two things that she thought that we could not do if we were going to be successful. We couldn't smoke cigarettes and we couldn't drink alcoholic beverages. I did great on the first one. If, I promise you, if all America, and you especially, had have had Ms. Johnson for your teacher, nobody would smoke cigarettes because you would remember that little rhyme in your head as soon as you saw one. We had to say this, I'm telling you, almost every day in that little school when she was there. We had to say that tobacco was a filthy weed and from the devil does proceed. <laughs> it picks your pockets and burns your clothes and makes a smokestack of your nose. <laughs> uh, but, but look, on this, on this drinking thing, she was much more serious. She had a button about this big around. I know she got it in that prohibition days for you foreign students. That's when America had this crazy experiment outlawing drinking. You know, France and England and other countries could not understand that. But we did. And, and this button, she, I'm sure she led the troops when that Constitutional Amendment was debated and voted on. And she led the troops down in our county. And on this button it said, lips that touch wine shall not touch mine. <laughs> and she died, she died an old maid. <laughs> but one day, one day she was going on and on in class with her temperance lesson. And I'm 12 years old. I'm just a lawyer to be in 1948. I'm sitting there and I'm listening. And I'd heard her talk before. And I said, but Miss Johnson, you told us last week that Jesus, in one of his miracles, turned water into wine. And she said, yes, Morris, but we'd have thought a whole lot more of Jesus if he hadn't have done that. <laughs> yeah. And that was just part of her mentorship. <laughs> <laughs> the other part was that she had a social conscience of in her own way back then. She would take us out in front of that little school and we'd raise a flag and put our hands on our hearts and pledge allegiance. And I remember the words that stuck with me so many years afterwards and oftentimes she repeated them in class. One nation with liberty 
and justice for all. Wasn't much that that little lady could do back in that small community in the 40s to go against the customs, but she often told us that she didn't think that colored people, as she called them, were treated fairly. Well, I, I didn't do a whole lot back then early on. It took another one of my neighbors to take a giant step forward. Rosa Parks, who lived not far from my grandmother's house, refused to give up her seat on the bus and started the America's Civil Rights Movement. I like to think it's the last battle in the American Revolution that gave so many people rights they didn't have. But it took another man to lead that social action movement, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, a man who laid claim to a destiny that his people had been denied so long. He was a person who had to face many of his contemporaries, like you will if you come up with new innovative ideas that had little vision. He had to face politicians and policymakers with no backbone. And finally, he faced a terrorist with no conscience. And when he faced that terrorist in Memphis, Tennessee, he wasn't there trying to integrate anything, which was part of his whole mission to equal the playing field for blacks and whites and American people of color. He was there demonstrating and speaking for truly the least among us. Garbage workers who were making very little pay, less than a dollar an hour for 10 to 12 hours of hard work every day. And he made that talk in, at a church there and before that fatal day when he lost his life. And Dr. King said, you know, folks, he said, I've been to the mountaintop and I've seen the promised land. He said, I might, I might not get there with you, but it's the land of fairness and justice. Well, I think most of you know what Dr. Martin Luther King was talking about. He was talking about a story of another group of ex-slaves. A group of slaves, Jews, who'd been kept as slaves in Egypt and they had been released from slavery and were seeking their promised land. This group traveled from place to place, received awful treatment along the way, and finally they got to that river that separated them from that promised land, the River Jordan. And they stood on the banks of this river and they looked across after wandering so long in the wilderness and they looked across and they saw people doing well. People had fine homes and the fields were beautiful and they were ready to go and take advantage of the opportunities they had been promised. And several people in the group said, I don't know, I don't know if we should actually go over there now because these people are different than we are. They may not accept us. We don't kind of look like them. And they argued back and forth and others said, let's go now. Well, most of you probably know the story. They didn't go. They wandered for 40 more years in the wilderness before they came back. Well, America, since Dr. King led the civil rights movement, and since he died, it's been a little more than 40 years. And America, during that 40 years, didn't really cross that metaphorical river, so to speak, and take full advantage We've taken three steps forward and two steps back until November two years ago when the voters of this nation elected America's first African-American president, something that Rosa Parks and Dr. King and others would be so proud of. I know I was. I know that my family was. I know that many of you were. But since he's become president, things have been quite different. I don't really think that most Americans want a black president or a black face for this country because the backlash against Barack Obama has been enormous. 
Not that there aren't valid criticisms to make with anybody who's in that position of leadership. But here's a president who, who undertook things that had happened in this country he had nothing to do with. Eight years of deregulating banks that caused the worst housing crisis in, that we've seen since the Great Depression. Two wars that he had nothing to do with starting that we'll spend three, two to three trillion dollars and maybe more before they're over. You name it. A crisis that is facing America today and it gives opportunities for new innovators to deal with. But not only did, are we having the political issues dealing with this, we're having talking heads on television like Glenn Beck, who says that Obama hates whites, ridiculous, and, who, and others that, that pour, pour out what I call mainstreaming of hate. The things that we heard from neo-Nazi groups and Klan groups earlier are coming from people today who are talking to millions of people on Fox News and other places it, as if it's just okay to say. There's been an increase in hate groups since Obama took the presidency of about double the number. There are some 1,000 hate groups today in this country ranging from neo-Nazi skinheads to you name it. You can find them on our website. And there's also been an explosion of these so-called patriot groups, the kind that, uh, oh, that Timothy McVeigh was a part of when he bombed the Oklahoma Federal Building. We've seen a tripling of those groups since Obama took the presidency. There's a lot of ill feeling, there's a lot of trouble, and there's a lot of concern and anxiety going on in our country today. Things that you as students are gonna be dealing with from years to come. But you know, I think the real issue is not just Obama, but maybe something he represents. And that is, America is changing. When I was in Ms. Johnson's class in 1948 in that little school in Pike Road, Alabama, about 17% of the people in the United States as a whole were people of color. This last census has that number now up to 37%. And this last year, in 2010, over 50% of the babies born were people of color. So by the year 2040, this nation won't look like the people in this room, myself. It'll be a different face of America. And between now and then, there are gonna be some drastic changes, but when you have changes, it's kind of like shifts of rocks under the earth that come together and clash and you get earthquakes out of it all. Well, there are gonna be some real changes in this country and there's gonna be some resistance to those changes. How are we gonna split the economic pie? Who gets more health care, or how much money do we send fighting battles in Iraq and Iran and other places in the world? There are gonna be some real issues. And you know, I think that, uh, that, that Regardless of how it comes out, we're going to be more successful as a nation. I had no idea what diversity was all about. I grew up on that little cotton farm, as I said, it was just the blacks and the whites and, and you know, I didn't know, I didn't much, I mean, I didn't take my first trip out of Alabama until I graduated from law school. And I took a trip outside at that point. Obviously, we went to the beach, but that's not out of Alabama. That's just down the road a little piece. And my folks didn't have money to travel, so I didn't know much about the broader na nation. And, and I didn't understand this whole issue of diversity and the change until I had an opportunity to represent some immigrants, some new Americans. After the Vietnam War, after America lost that war, about 500,000 Vietnamese were brought to this country, some in this state, by Catholic Relief Services and other groups because had they stayed behind, these people probably would have been tortured or killed or imprisoned. So they came here. And about 50,000 of those settled in the Houston, Galveston Bay, Texas area. They got to this country with the clothes on their backs. They worked hard. And down there, Vietnamese people began to 
take over all kinds of businesses through their hard work. Car washes, fruit stands, small grocery stores, small businesses of all types. And about 50 or so of them decided that they wanted to go in down to Keemer, Texas, where the, the Gulf Coast is. They wanted to get into the shrimping and fishing business. Well, they had no money to buy expensive boats, and there were several hundred American trawlers working those areas fishing. Boats, it cost two, three, four hundred thousand dollars. And these Vietnamese fishermen, having fished in the warm waters around Saigon Harbor and other places around the Vietnam, they, they, they understood how to make it on the cheap, so to speak, so they bought old broken down boats. Boats that Americans had long abandoned, they were sitting in shallow harbors just rotting away, and they fixed these boats up. And these 50 or so Vietnamese fishermen went out to fish, and it wasn't long before they were out fishing the American fishermen in their big, fancy, expensive boats. And there's no other way to put it, but the American fishermen became jealous. They had an association, 1,200 members, and they went to the Texas legislature and said, we want you to pass a law not allowing these people to have fishing licenses. Well, the Texas legislature, in its wisdom, said, we can't do that. These are our friends. They're our allies. This is a free enterprise country. And so they refused to, to do what these American fishermen wanted to do. So the American fishermen turned to the oldest existing terrorist group in the world, founded in the mid-1800s in America, the Ku Klux Klan. They turned to the Texas Knights of the Ku Klux Klan and said, we want you to help us get rid of these Vietnamese fishermen. And well, the Klan was glad to help, and they burned some boats, and FBI and other people tried to catch them. They knew who did it. It was difficult to catch them, but it certainly frightened the Vietnamese. They burned a giant cross like the Klan burns and down near Kemo, Texas, where Clear Creek Channel comes out. And this frightened the Vietnamese. They understood the Khmer Rouge, the terrorists of, of Cambodia and Vietnam. So they decided that they wouldn't take those boats out in the open waters and get a chance to get shot at or sunk. So they put their boats up for sale. I got a call from a lawyer down who represented them in real estate matters and said, could you come and help us see if we can stop the arrest of these fishermen? I remember going down with some people from the law center and walking up and down the dock in Kemer, Texas, and I saw the little boats sitting there in the water. You've probably seen them in pictures, little tiny boats, glass wheelhouses, kind of rocking there, docked up, shrimping season open two weeks from then. And they had little for sale signs in the windows of these boats, the kind of signs you'd buy in a hardware store. And Nguyen Van Nam was with me, the leader of the Vietnamese fishermen, and I said, you know, Nam, we'd done a little investigation. I said, we can bring a lawsuit in federal court, and we can get the court to issue an order prohibiting anybody from bothering you. It's called an injunction. We can get a quick injunction, I believe, with the help we've gotten from law enforcement to put the facts together. And if anybody violates that rule, that court order, they'll go to prison for criminal contempt of court. Well, the fishermen agreed, and we went to work. We had to work quickly because shrimping season opened. The judge gave us a quick hearing, and we found some American fishermen who didn't like what they had seen either. They had learned these Vietnamese <coughs> as friends. And so they told us stories about how they had been threatened by the Klan and others. If they let the Vietnamese park their boats at their docks, they'd burn their docks. Perfect testimony. Well, we're getting ready to go to court on Monday morning, and about Sunday around midday, I got a call from Nguyen Van Nam. He said, Mr. Dees, drop the lawsuit. I said, oh, no, man, why? What's happened? He said, well, our people are frightened, but the leaders of the other Vietnamese business have come to us and said, let the Klan have the fishing. We don't want them bothering our other businesses. I said, man, it don't work that way. If you cut and run now, they're going to come after everything you got. They don't like you here. I said, do you think that you could pull together leaders of the Vietnamese groups in town and also the fishermen's families? I want to talk to them. Because if you tell me I have to drop your lawsuit, I have to tell the court we're out of here, no clients. Well, that night, in a room about this size, with about half this many people present in a small church, 
I was standing in a pulpit with a Catholic priest interpreting. Many of these people sitting there had, had the clothes they came to this country in, patiently listening. And I said, you know, folks, America is a nation of laws. Laws that protect the minority from the majority if the majority is breaking the law. It's a concept most people don't understand in other parts of the world, our democratic system. I said, but don't, don't, don't drop your lawsuit. Stick it out. So there was a man that most of you probably don't know who also used our courts in the face of horrible tragedies for his people. His name was the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. His churches and his people's churches were bombed when they tried to get the right to vote in good schools. And, but they stuck with America's justice system in one case time and time again. And they wouldn't have gotten their rights had they not done so. I left and I know it must have been a contentious evening there. I couldn't tell much about the people's faces as, they, as I talked to them. Later that night, around midnight, I got a call from New and Van Nam. He said, Mr. Dees, continue the lawsuit. We put on a good case, and the judge issued a very strong order naming about 30 people and requiring them not to go near the Vietnamese fishermen under contempt of federal contempt of court. Well, that made the Vietnamese happy, and they were going to go on out to fish on Monday morning and invited me down to the blessing of the fleet tradition in Vietnam. I got down there at Seabrook, Texas and Kimmer where little towns on either side of Clear Creek Channel where the boats come out of the channel out into the open waters. It was about five in the morning. Fog was hanging heavy over the bay. As I got to the dock and there were families of these fishermen all there waiting, a Catholic priest there to bless the boats as they went by. We didn't hear any boats until finally there was a heard a little diesel engine chugging and a boat popped out through the fog and came out into the open waters by the review and stand. And the priest blessed that boat and another and another until 15 or 20 boats had gone out into the water to fish. The sun began to burn through the fog as daylight came. And I could look around me on either side and I could see the sun glistening off the badges of the United States Marshals who had been sent there by the court to enforce that court order, the marshals of the police force of the federal courts. And also, as I looked around me, I could see the pride on the faces of these new Americans as they found a place at America's table. Not just a place at America's table, but so to speak, building that table bigger and better and greater for the rest of this country. And I'd have to tell you, standing there that morning, I felt so proud to be the lawyer representing these new Americans. But I also felt proud of America's justice system, seeing the majesty of our justice system at work. And for the first time, I really understood that America is great because of our diversity, not in spite of it. And we're facing this horrible laws being passed by states like Alabama and Arizona and New Mexico and other places, demagoguing, demagogic laws restricting the rights of Latino immigrants who in this country is probably some 11 million, maybe undocumented, that's the only crime they committed, but they are working the packing houses and the fields and the construction work and doing work as the New York Times said in the story this morning that Americans won't stoop down and do. Work that needs to be done. In Alabama the law is so bad, it's just a political thing. Farmers are screaming now there's nobody to pick our tomatoes and plant this and that and the other. But it's politicians who are demagoguing people who have no vote and have no power, like George Wallace did the blacks, and they had no vote and had no power. Today, you won't see anybody in Alabama doing that because African Americans do have the vote and do have the power. But this isn't something new for America, and I doubt if it'll end with that. 
When my people came to this United States from Ireland in the 1840s and 50s, over two million, much greater percentage than those Latinos in our country today, they were roundly condemned. They said they didn't speak English. They spoke some cockney thing and they didn't, that wasn't English. They said they were stealing American jobs. Doesn't that sound familiar? Well, good thing we didn't have a, a Bachman running for president then because she wants to build an electrified double fence along Mexico. But these people got into this country and uh, they did well. But actually, some of them were actually lynched. You saw the gangs in the New York movie. They were killed in Boston and Philadelphia, New York for stealing American jobs. They were demeaned as troublemakers, as drunkards, and you name it. And I'm telling you, if I'd have been standing in a church in a pulpit in Boston Commons making this speech today, like then, like I'm doing today, and I said, let me tell you, folks, before 100 years from now, one of my kin folks is going to be president of the United States. I'd have been booed out of the room, maybe arrested. And then when the Jews came in here from Eastern Europe in 1905 to 1920, escaping torture and all of Eastern Europe and Russian places, they were condemned too as new Americans. Oh my goodness, there were signs that says, no Jews or dogs allowed in this hotel. It was no different than the way the Irish immigrants were treated. Harvard actually ended up in 1924 with about 18 or 20 percent of its students being Jewish and so did a lot of other schools in Yale and Princeton and all of a sudden they said, ooh, ooh we, got a, we got a Jewish problem here. So they cut the quotas back. Well, we solved those problems, you know, had we not had those good people here. We probably wouldn't have had the Jonas Salk here because that's where his people came from. A man who invented the polio vaccine that saved a lot of millions and millions of America from torture and death. I could go on and on about the people that came to this country. And it's going to be up to you to realize that, that we need these people from all over America in this country today, especially today. The Chinese who came in to build the railroads that cut through the granite Sierras, and many died, 20% of them died, were injured. And after they connected the rails from east to west, Congress passed the law saying no Chinese person could become a citizen of the United States that was here. It came for that. And the same with the Japanese who were rounded up and others. This nation has a history, and it's important that you learn that history. But it's a, also a tragic history, but it's a great history. Democracy allows for ups and downs, but it's up to you as students to stay on the cutting edge of this fight for justice because the march for justice continues. And it didn't end with the civil rights movement like we like to package little things up in history classes. And it's not going to end with the rights of gays and lesbians, bisexual and transgender people who are gaining more rights today. It's not going to end with the equal rights for women. That's been a big movement that's gone a long ways. Started with the simple right to vote. It's not going to end there. It's going to be a lot, there are going to be a lot of other issues, issues that are unpopular often to deal with. This country is divided in so many ways, in probably the most important and significant ways along class lines, economic lines. You know, I think that America's going to solve these problems. Back when we saw James Byrd dragged behind a pickup truck to his death down in Texas and Matthew Shepard, a student like many of you who was beaten and killed because of his sexual orientation at the University of Wyoming, we think, what's going on in this country? We looked around uh, at, at colleges and campuses and we looked around at communities and we sent investigators out and researchers saying, what can we do with the Southern Poverty Law Center it's one thing to fight hate in court, but we, we're missing out on something here. Maybe we can teach acceptance and tolerance in classrooms. So as we went out looking to find out what's going on in this country, people were telling us and our researchers everywhere, we're not like that. We, in our, those people that are committing these horrible things, they don't represent us. We found people reaching out to those individuals who had been prejudiced against and biased in one way or another from hate crimes to 
discrimination, and they're reaching out to them saying, we understand your pain. We want to be a part of you, and we want you to be a part of us. Stories that we, our researchers brought back were sometimes very touching. I remember one story out of Billings, Montana. You may have heard. There, there's a town that's about like this state with 4% minorities. Well, Billings had hardly no minorities and hardly no Jews and small town. And, and there, a Jewish family purchased their little son a menorah, the candle holder used in Hanukkah. And this little boy was so proud to get his candle holder, he put it on a window in front of, if we can see it from the street, on a table, and he lit a candle each night of Hanukkah. And that was a man who saw it and didn't appreciate or like what was, he saw there. I guess it was a man that never caught him, and he threw a brick through the window. Well, there was another man in that town who didn't like what he had seen either, that desecration and discrimination. And so he was a businessman. He wasn't Jewish. He had a shop. He sold things in town. So he took the letters off the marquee of the place where he sold his products and had in place put there, not in our town. And they had cardboard menorahs made at a print shop, and they placed those in with the help of the schools and the police department and others in the town, they placed them in the windows of most houses facing the street in Billings in support of that little victim of that hate crime. And one night, their mother and father took this little boy around after dinner so he could see. As he drove down the street, he looked and he could see the, the backlight from the houses backlighting showing these menorahs and he, he drove up I and mean, he kept seeing more and more. And he turned to his mom and said, Mom, I didn't know so many Jews lived in Billings. <laughs> and she said, No, son. They're our friends. And therein, I think, lies the answer. When we build bridges across the divides that separate us, it'll be because we become friends. We learn to care about, appreciate, and love those people who are different. The crisis that we're facing in America today with this unemployment and millions without health care, people suffering, it'll be because our leaders in this country being pressured by people just like you to reach across those divides that separate us and come up with a solution to help us all, so we'll have truly a nation with liberty and justice for all. Dr. Martin Luther King walked among us at a time when there was no liberty and justice for all. Most of you can't even imagine, unless you're my age, what it was like in the South and in, actually in other parts of the United States. It wasn't just the South. When blacks were treated less than second class, and Dr. King then was concerned that America as a nation, as a democracy, would continue. And he told us an old story. I heard him tell this story. He, he spent much time in Montgomery. He told us this story as a warning. And I think he'd tell you the same story today if he was here. It was an old story. It was a story about a, a nation that started with great promise a nation that no longer existed. It had strayed from its values and its ideals. Those Jews that left slavery in Egypt got to that river, as Dr. King said. And they did cross finally after 40 years. America, you know, has been waiting 40 years since the Civil Rights Movement, and I think with the election of Obama, we kind of crossed that river too and made that big jump, metaphorically, just like those Jews did. And when they got there, they built themselves a great city, called a city-state back then, with high walls around it to protect it, a big gate they locked at night. And inside of that town, those that worked hard and were successful had nice homes and building lots to put those homes on and fertile fields. And they had a banking system. They had a, a school system. They had a court system, law enforcement, just like we do today. And in the middle of this town, they had a great marketplace where people from outside of this town came in 
and brought their products to sell. And there was a farmer who got there early in the morning with his wagon laden with produce from his farm from a neighboring town. And as he was there early in the morning waiting for those gates to open, he saw able-bodied men and women reaching out, begging for a few grains from his wagon. And upon inquiry, he learned that, well, if you didn't, if you weren't part of the in group in this town, if you didn't have money and power, you didn't get a job. If you got a job, it wasn't a good job to feed your family. And then this farmer, when he put his products in the stall in the marketplace, he heard grumbling from the people walking by. And upon inquiry, he learned that, and he talked to them, that, that they heard them dissatisfied with the way things were going in the town. If you were in an in group, sometimes you didn't get arrested when somebody who was different and wasn't a part of the in group got arrested. Same when you go to court, you didn't get a fair shake. And this really bothered this farmer because he knew the trials and tribulations of these people. He knew their suffering. And he was a man of some means and reputation in his little community. And he asked for an audience with the leaders. I think some of you here might know who this farmer was. He was the biblical prophet Amos. Amos stood up in front of those leaders and said, you know, folks, you got a good thing going here. But unless you're fair to all the people among you and give people an equal opportunity, you're not going to get to keep what you have and pass it down to future generations. It's going to be taken away from you. And Amos closed his comments out, comments that were used by Dr. Martin Luther King when he spoke to us so often. Amos said, People, don't be satisfied until justice rolls down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. I feel confident that you people here with the reputation of this school for social action and people who come out of here and others like you all across this country will not be satisfied until justice truly rolls down like waters. Remember, remember, that equal rights begin close to home. That's where people seek equal justice. In our schools, in our communities, our workplaces. And unless people find equal rights and equal treatment in these places, we'll look as a nation in vain for progress in a larger world. But I have confidence that, that you will live up to the promises in our Constitution, the promises that were made whole by Dr. Martin Luther King and others in America's civil rights movement, and that you truly will not be satisfied until you do your part. And I think that one day, when myself and most of you out here with gray hair like me are gone, one of you, going to write a story about, about your generation. I would say a book, but it'll probably be on a Kindle <laughs> or maybe something else. And I have to tell you, I got confidence in you and this country. And that book is going to be a book about your generation, which I think is going to be one of America's greatest generations. Thank you so much.